Hi. Well, congratulations on another great Bob Fest. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Matt. There's a big bull back there, but there ain't no bull up here, I'll tell you that. Um, well, I bring good news and bad news, and anybody that knows you will, um, knows me uh, knows I'll take those in reverse order. It's, it's not for nothing that uh, a lot of people listening to my radio show have called me an optaholic. I just refuse to be downcast. Um, but I will start with the bad news. You know, we're in some pretty tough times. Five years after the U.S.-led invasion of Iraq, there are now more U.S. troops and more private armies doing uh, killing in Iraq. Um, there's more dying going on on all sides. Another dozen U.S. troops were killed, I think, in the last two days. And at least that many Iraqis died in just one attack by U.S. forces on a neighborhood they said was filled with resistors. Well, fancy that. Um, Oxfam calls the, the situation in Iraq a humanitarian disaster. I guess that's what you call it when you um, kill and torture people in the name of bringing them democracy. Uh, we're very humanitarian. Um, an entirely buried Oxfam report says that there are now three times as many Iraqi children born uh, underweight as before the War of Liberation. Um, more than a quarter of all kids suffer from malnutrition. Over 40% of Iraqis live in absolute poverty, and there is now raw sewage uh, running down the rivers of the Tigris and the Euphrates. Uh, makes you wonder about what those two rivers gave birth to. We once called it civilization. Well, so if in Iraq you have this humanitarian disaster, I would say we have a, a democratarian disaster right here at home. Uh, that's when Democrats say, um, trust us, we're Democrats, we believe in you, we work for you, that's why we entirely ignore everything you've asked us to do. Instead of ending the war, the party that was elected to do just that has voted to extend it. And instead of doing anything serious like uh, cutting off the gravy train to the gun makers or impeaching the war makers, Democratic majority leaders Harry Reid and Nancy Pelosi are said to have set their sights now on, yes, you guessed it, compromise. More compromise. Now let's think about it. Right now, you've got a White House that wants 141 more billion dollars for Iraq. 141 billion more dollars. Just think about it. Wisconsin Congressman David Obey chairs the Appropriations Committee in the House. If he refuses to permit a vote on that appropriation to come to the floor, that appropriation will not be made. Let's be clear, 85% of Iowa Democrats in that critical primary state, 20% of Iowa Democrats want troops out in six months, of course. 51% of Iowa Republicans want the very same thing. To stop pulling up troops of Iraq is not going out on some radical limb. It's barely catching up with the majority of Republicans in Iowa. But. According to press accounts this weekend, the uh, big uh, Democratic plan for the fall is to come up with such a feeble Iraq resolution to get us out, get U.S. troops out, that even those people who voted to put troops in will vote for it. Maybe the GOP will agree to a teeny weeny withdrawal of just a few troops in time for primary season. And perhaps the president, if he's not too busy telling people that we're kicking ass in, a, in, in Iraq, that's what he told the Australian deputy prime minister. Perhaps the president, if he's not too busy talking about kicking ass, um, might possibly be persuaded to comply with the will of Congress. Maybe. The democratic plan is a utter pushover even before General Petraeus speaks and the media falls into their annual 9-11 swoon in front of anyone in a uniform. The Democratic leadership at this point will listen to men in the military. They'll listen to the military men, they'll listen to the missionary men, they'll listen to the millionaires, the free marketeers, they'll even listen to the GOP, the greedy oil profiteers in the White House, before they'll listen to us and their own voters. 
Well, thank, good thank goodness there's always Osama bin Laden. I think that's the one person the democratic leadership's not actually willing to make um, bipartisan agreements with, not yet. So you've got the humanitarian disaster in Iraq. I Americans tell Iraqis, trust us, we're Americans. We uh, kill you because we love you. Sounds like a wife beater. Um, then you've got the democratarian disaster at home where they say, trust us, we're Democrats. We ignore you because we love you. And it's not just on the Iraq question. On that situation, it's taken a, a world of protest and a mounting grisly death toll to persuade democratic leaders that maybe war and occupation are a lose-lose proposition. Well, at home, it's as if they're utterly incapable of recognizing a winning issue when they see one. Think about it. We have a lot of winning issues. There was a study done just this month by AFSC, the American Friends Service Committee. Um, they report, not surprisingly, for anybody who's sort of living and breathing right now, that uh, one in ten people in this country is living in poverty. And in case any of us have forgotten what that means, the official definition is $16,000 for a family of three. I'm not talking per week or per month, I'm talking per year. 47 million Americans have no health care. 23 million seek emergency food each year. And not unreasonably, because we're good people, most people in this country want government to do something. A Pew Research poll from earlier this year showed that what they called, the people at Pew called, they showed a dramatic increase in the ranks of those who believe government should be spending more money, not less, on helping people who are poor even at the expense of balancing the blessed budget. The majority of Americans consistently tell pollsters that they're even willing to pay more taxes if it'll bring them quality education and free health care. The ranks who call themselves strongly religious is down. The ranks of those who support affirmative action for people of color and women is hugely up, up to 70%, but you wouldn't know that listening to Democrats. The biggest winning cause of all, it turns out, according to the people from Pew, is gay equality, LGBT equality, otherwise known as human equality, if you don't mind me saying so. Today, according to Pew, and these are no radical folks, they didn't just poll the East Village, you know, they didn't just poll downtown Manhattan. Today, almost 60% of white evangelical Protestants think it's wrong to fire queer teachers from public schools. <laughs> now, okay, al allowing people to go and work in our high schools is not exactly doing them a big favor, but still, hallelujah, right? <laughs> Same with abortion. After 30 years of backlash, bombings, murders, you name it, very little defense of a woman's right to choose. Still, the majority of Americans say, nope, we still support legal abortion no matter what, you can stuff it. To which, to which, what do those Democratic consultants say? Those are the facts. Those are the winning issues. That's where the country is at. That's what you hear anytime you talk to your neighbors. What do the Democratic consultants tell those candidates? They say, hush, don't talk about any of those scary things. Remember after 2004, what they were told was, what we were all told was, we should do reframing of our issues and our beliefs. Remember that? They said, better to frame what you believe in. Lots of talk about God and guns. And if you happen to have gay children, do what the vice president does. Just pray for grandchildren you can actually have your picture taken with. So what's the result of all this? You have candidates who speak as if they are utterly cut off at the heart and have no idea what's going on in their head. You've got people like the woman who wants to be the leader of the free world, and wouldn't it be great to have a woman president? But the woman who wants to be the leader of the free world, not to mention the world, when she was asked point blank, do you think homosexuality is immoral? Her off the cuff immediate response was, I'll leave others to make up their minds about that. That is not leadership. And it's not a way to win elections. <laughs> and when a candidate doesn't talk as if they have no connection between their mouth and their, their heart, when a candidate talks as if they actually care about something, they're ridiculed resolutely by the media. 
Look at John Edwards, he actually talks about there perhaps being some more important things in the world than balancing the budget, like ending poverty. He wins polls in Iowa, but the media say, don't you worry about any winning he may be doing. As far as we're concerned, he's a loser. And who's more important, the people or we the media? I'm afraid the answer is a little bit out on that with respect to presidential candidates. Well, you know, there's a word for people and for a frame that is built about around uh, fear of being honest, right? There's a word for being scared to say what you believe and, and who you are and, and, and what you believe in. And that is a closet, right? Isn't that what we call it? And the answer to being in the closet is coming out. People who respect themselves attract respect. Bob LaFollette knew that. Tammy Baldwin knows that. That's what we all know. Now, I, say I, would bring, I, I said I would bring good news, and I will. Um, after the election of 2004, I was on the air at Air America Radio um, uh, in, on the night of 2004, and I listened to Democratic voters' hearts breaking from coast to coast. People had poured out their heart and soul into that election. They'd put out money. They'd put out names. They'd traveled across the country. They really did everything they could think of. You, we all did everything we could think of to get rid of um, Bush and Cheney. And on election night, it was as if people had seen one too many of those vote or die posters, and they hadn't quite expected to do both. Um, I called it the night of the politically living dead. And I spent the evening, so many people were calling in saying they were going to move to Canada that somebody from Vancouver finally called in and said, you do know you need a visa to come here. <laughs> so I spent the night trying to cheer people up and say, okay, White House bad, but hey, the votes aren't all counted yet. And uh, besides, people in blue states, like Flo I mean, in red states like Florida and Nevada, managed to raise the minimum wage. You had some victories go down, uh, despite what you heard. Uh, listen, what happened in Montana? The governor there is a Democrat for the first time in 16 years. And then I went home and I thought, maybe I'm dreaming. Um, perhaps I should go and check all my optimism out. So I decided to travel the country to find out what was really going on. I traveled from um, Milwaukee, right here in Milwaukee, to uh, Miami, to Salt Lake City, to Las Vegas, and I found that there is a whole tide of what I call blue grit Democrats rising up, and they're big D, little d. Uh, they've had enough of these mealy-mouthed, cut-off-at-the-heart, closeted politicians, and they're coming out. Um, They're not only doing what the Democratic Party has failed to do in years, like talk to people on their doorsteps and appoint precinct captains, fancy that, and computerize voting roles, genius. Um, they're also talking about things that matter, from public financing of elections and voting rights to the war in Iraq and the need to reconstruct not just the Gulf Coast, but our entire national priorities from top to bottom. Um, you don't often see them in the media. Look at that Montana race, for example. In Montana, the media would have you believe that uh, Brian Schweitzer run the gov won the governorship in uh, 2004 and John Testa won his Senate seat last year simply because he, they both really knowed, knew how to um, get on with Westerners. You would think that all you have to do out West is put on a cowboy hat and, uh, and a bolo tie and that's it. They're all going to vote for you. That's pretty much what the coverage amounted to. Um, well, the reality is local environmentalists, women's organizations, and Native Americans have been busy for years on the electoral front, redrawing, redistri redrawing district maps, mobilizing people, um, signing up new voters by the thousand. That's what paid off. Montanans may like a man in a cowboy hat, but uh, the Western outfit alone is not going to do it. People power is what makes the difference. And there's a lot of people power out there. You can read more about what happened in Montana in my book. Um, in New Hampshire, people like Carol Shea Porter ran for office and won. Shea Porter helped flip New Hampshire uh, from red to blue by doing exactly what the Democratic consultants told her not to do. She talked about Iraq, she ran a grassroots campaign, and she didn't give a damn what Rahm Emanuel and the DCCC told her, especially... <laughs> They told her that she didn't even have a chance. Marcy Winograd of Progressive Democrats of America um, had an impact in California without even winning. Since Winograd ran against Jane Harmon, Harmon, who used to be a big hawk on the House Armed Services Committee, um, has started bleating about peace. She's almost sounding like a dove. 
And in Maryland, you've got the great progressive feminist Donna Edwards running against the conservative Democrat Al Wynn, friend of the bankers. And, uh, well, Al Wynn's, uh, last time I looked, he came out in favor of impeachment. So you can have an impact by not winning. And I'm actually, I want to go on the record, I am one of those people who believes that it's actually exciting and good that Cindy Sheehan is threatening to run against Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> run, Cindy, run, I say. You know, the answer to bad democracy isn't better manners, it's more democracy. Um, and now I don't care too much whether you're running as a Democrat or a Green or a member of the all-night party. Um, Greens, by the way, have elected officials now in 30 states. Good on you. The number of independent voters is growing faster than any other kind, so uh, the, 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 you know, the odds are up. The game's there for the winning. The point is using power differently. You know, I don't believe it's, it's, it's fear that's holding us back, and I'm drawing to a close. I don't believe that it's fear that's holding us back. We keep hearing about fear, fear, fear. What are they talking about? I've spent a good amount of time in the last two years in the South. And I've hung out with people who have a lot to be fearful of. Rising water, rising crime, falling wages, stolen homes, closed public schools. And yet there is a rising determination coming out of the part, that part of this country to get into the streets, to get organized, and to build an international, I mean, a, a nationally connected fighting force for people power in the USA. This summer, poor and working people and people of color, young people, women, and immigrants held the first US social forum in Atlanta, Georgia. Everybody told them they couldn't do it. All the foundations said they could never do it. All the political parties said they could never do it. A whole lot of the 501c3s told them they couldn't do it, and they went ahead and they did it anyway, and the poorest groups in the country raised the money to bring 15,000 people by bus to Atlanta. And you know it was important what happened there. They talked about how to fight the, the closing of public housing. They talked about how to rebuild their cities. They talked about how to reclaim and improve public schools. And they talked about what they could do to fight for workers' rights altogether instead of being divided over this issue of immigration. And you know it's important what happened there because you didn't hear a peep about it in most of the media. And the people of the US Social Forum have seen way, 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 way more than their share of terror the domestic terror of private contractors, and the Minutemen vigilante groups that our government has given the green light to. After decades of the Klan and the courts, and just about every other threat a soul could bear, I don't think they're scared so much as skeptical. They wonder if anyone ever is going to take their side. Now, someone like La Follette shows there are people who are willing to take the side of, the side of those folks. And it shows what's possible. And I want to end with a little story that's based right here in Wisconsin. It's the story of James White. Anyone know James White? He's a guy who was born in 1962, a few years back. He was a hip-hop artist, the ghetto priest. He's in Milwaukee. He was actually the first hip-hop artist to perform in South Africa after Nelson Mandela was released. In 1996, at the ripe old age of 34, James decided to run for office. He got involved in his local Democratic Party. Didn't like it much, but worked with it anyway. Got involved in his local Democratic Party, ran for Milwaukee County Commission. And he was elected first district supervisor in 1996, and he was re-elected in 2000 and 2004. Well, while people all over this country were bemoaning the fate of the Gulf Coast and New Orleans, White came up with an idea. He proposed a resolution to ban the county of Milwaukee from doing business with any one of the 15 companies that had been cited by the government accounting office for waste, fraud, or mismanagement on any Katrina or Rita-related contract. Not only... I, I'm, glad, I'm glad that you're clapping at the proposal because it's important to propose great stuff. That's how we move our issues forward even when we don't win. But he did win. He won a veto-proof majority on that resolution this June. And a whole lot of powerful people were very angry. 
Because one very large company, for example, that does business with the county on transport, C2MH Hill, lost $30 million of contracts because of what they hadn't done for the people of New Orleans. And I sat James White, lovely guy, when I, sa I sat James White down with uh, a woman called Monique Harden, one of the leaders of one of the survivor groups in New Orleans, um, at a, down at my microphones when I was down at the social forum last, uh, last whenever it was, July. And um, they talked. And Monique, who said, was one of those people that felt skeptical that anybody ever listened to anything the people from the Gulf had to say, and that anybody was coming to their aid, and that anybody cared, she just thanked White. She thanked James, and she said, thank you. What you did gives us confidence, she told Radio Nation. It makes us believe. It makes us believe that people can do more than petition their government. They can become their government, or they can go down fighting like Bob LaFollette did. Read Blue Grit. I'm selling it back there. I'll sign it for you. It's about getting our confidence back. It's happening in this country. You're just not going to hear about it or see it on your TV. As my dearly beloved and, and much missed friend and progressive magazine contributor June Jordan, the poet, wrote, she said, we are the people. We are not fringe elements or special interest groups or so-called minorities. Without us, there is no legitimate majority. We are the mainstream. We have become the people. And let our elected leadership beware. We are not, this is now me speaking, we are not in this for a democratic majority or for turning red states blue. We are in this for change in our lives and in our communities and protection of this planet and this country that we love. And we're not waiting. And we're not going to do any more waiting for anyone's say so, are we? Are we going to wait around for someone to give us permission? We're doing it. We're going to demand change. We're going to make change. You know, there was the World Health Organization released a report, I think it was just yesterday, saying people with money live 30 years longer on this planet than people without. So I reckon we all have at least 30 years we owe the rest of this planet to work to make change. And I'm not just talking about moaning about change that other people should make. I'm saying we make it right now. We are the people. And as June said, and my friends in, in, again in Milwaukee at the campaign for violence, the campaign against violence say, we are the ones we have been waiting for. So get up off your asses, people. Make a difference. Thanks.